तुम जो देते हो मालिक माली वही अच्छा है मेरी चाहत ने दयाल ठाकुर दाता दयाल मेरे प्रिय परम गुरु परम आधार मेरे दीन दयाल ठाकुर दाता दयाल मेरे प्रिय परम गुरु परम आधार मेरे मालिक शरण में रण पीरण भी आए हो मालिक शरण में तेरे तारण पीरण भी आए जीवन पथ पर केवल सेवक मुझको बनाए इष्ट सेवा इष्ट करम सत्य धर्माधार मेरे इष्ट सेवा इष्ट करम सत्य धर्माधार मेरे तीन दयाल ठाकुर दाता दयाल मेरे प्रिय परम गुरु परम आधार सार 
জয় গুরু পরম প্রেমময় শ্রী শ্রী ঠাকুরের শ্রী হস্তলিখিত সত্যনশরণ থেকে পাঠ যার উপর যা কিছু সব দাঁড়িয়ে আছে তাই ধর্ম আর তিনি পরম পুরুষ ধর্ম কখনো বহু হয় না ধর্ম একই আর তার কোনো প্রকার নেই মত বহু হতে পারে এমন কি যত মানুষ ততই মত হতে পারে কিন্তু তাই বলে ধর্ম বহু হতে পারে না হিন্দু ধর্ম মুসলমান ধর্ম 
ख्रीटान धर्म बुद्ध धर्म इत्यादि कथा हमार मत बोल बरण सबग मत को मत संगे को मन प्रकृत पक्षे को बिरोध नहीं बाबर विभिन्नता रकम पेर एक के नान प्रकार एक रकम अनुभव सब मते साधाना विस्तार जो तब ता नान प्रकार होते और जतटुकु विस्तार जा तई अनुभूति ज्ञान तई धर्म अनुभूत ऊपर जय गुरु जय तु परम दया पुरुषोत्तम जगन्नाथ हरि विष्णु महेश्वर शाश्वत ठाकुर नाम चिरंतन जय तु परम दयाल पुरुषो पुरुषोत्तम जगन्नाथ हरि विष्णु महेश्वर जगन्नाथ हरि विष्णु महेश्वर शाश्वत ठाकुर नाम चिरंतन जय तु परम दयाल पुरुषोत्तम जय तु परम दयाल पुरुषोत्तम पुरुषोत्तम जय तु परम दयाल पुरुषोत्तम जगन्नाथ हरि विष्णु महेश्वर जगन्नाथ हरि विष्णु महेश्वर शाश्वत ठाकुर नाम चिरंतन जय तु परम दयाल पुरुषोत्तम जीवन दीपन योग विभूति परम वर्तन भगवत पुरुष कलुष प्राता भगवत पुरुष कलुष प्राता आदर्श पृष्ठ प्राण स्पंदन आदर्श पृष्ठ प्राण स्पंदन Shashwat 
ठाकुर नाम चिरंतन जय तु परम दयाल पुरुषोत्तम वैशिष्ट पाली निर्मल उज्वल अंशुवाणी चिराभिनंदित वैशिष्ट पाली निर्मल उज्वल अंशुवाणी आदिकार पूरन पुरुष आदिकार पूरन चरण मुक्ति विधायक धाम श्री चरण जय तु परम दयाल पुरुषोत्तम जय तु परम दयाल पुरुषोत्तम जगन्नाथ हरि विष्णु महेश्वर जगन्नाथ हरि विष्णु महेश्वर शाश्वत ठाकुर नाम चिरंतन जय तु परम दयाल पुरुषोत्तम जय तु परम दयाल पुरुषोत्तम जय तु परम आज ये आनंद दिन परम पूज्यपाद आचार्यदेव श्री श्री दादार रचित एक खानी संगीत दिए शुरू कर आ 
শাশ্বত সুন্দর অধিকার উচ্ছল আদি সতার শাশ্বত সুন্দর অধিকার কাটি আছে সব দৈন্য জীবন সার্থক ধন কাটি আছে সব দৈন্য জীবন সার্থক ধন জাগ্রত আজি চৈতন্য জাগ্রত আজি চৈতন্য হল জীবন জ্যোতির মাগে আখি
সঙ্গীতের শেষ নিবেদন আমরা পরিবেশন করব তার আগে একটা কথা আপনাদের সবার সাথে ভাগ করে নিতে বড্ড ইচ্ছে করছে সেটা হচ্ছে এবছর পূজনীয় আচার্যদেব সিসি দাদার জন্মতিথিতে আমরা একটা নতুন গান বেঁধেছি গানটির কথা ঠাকুর দয়া করে আমাকে দিয়ে করিয়ে নিয়েছেন আর সুর আমার হাজব্যান্ডের ঠাকুর করিয়ে নিয়েছেন আমরা নিমিত্ত মাত্র আমরা মাধ্যম তো সেই গানটা আমরা সিসি দাদার জন্মতিথিতে করেছি বেঁধেছি তাটা ইউটিউবে আপনারা সবাই পাবেন আজকে ছোট্ট করে দুটো লাইন একটু আপনাদের সাথে ভাগ করতে বড় ইচ্ছে করছে
साथी बीत न कोई ठगने आए बंधु भाई संगीन साथी बीत न कोई ठगने आए बंधु भाई चे तो अभी शरण में आओ चे तो अभी ठाकुर जीवन पथे सम्बन्धे इष्ट आलोचना करबें उन्नी यूनिवार्सिटी अब कैमब्रिजर एक एलुमन श्री प्रसन्न रे एस पी आर यू के हिज एलुमिन फ्रम यूनिवर्सिटी अफ कैमब्रिज स्टाडिंग फिजिक्स गोयिंग ऑन टू मेक अ करियर इन एनवायरमेंटल सस्टेनेबिलिटी एंड सायंस एंड रिनेबल एनर्जी हि वुड नाउ डू इष्ट आलोचना Let us listen to his blissful words and experience. Jai Guru. Jai Guru. Jai Guru. Sri Sri Thakur Anukul Chandra was sought after by many a person from diverse quarters of the human family for guidance, for direction in daily life. Born in 1888, during the course of his distinguished 81 years, he guided diverse many during the conception and spawn of the modern era. Therefore, even as the complexity of our daily life grew, he illuminated a clear way to navigate it, to maintain our purpose in realizing the one almighty. At one time, Sushi Thakur delivered a prayer directed at the one almighty and it is as follows 
my father, the supreme, the omnipotent, all pervading my heavenly heart, the beginning, the being that hath manifested, my God, O thou, revealed in flesh and blood, a child of thyself, to wash off the sorrows and sufferings with begotten blood, let thy blessing flush the dirt that are onerous, and make me pure and able with a tilt of blissful joy. Notice that even as it is a prayer to the Almighty One, reference is made to his manifested form in connection with our human existence. The being that hath manifested, the, a child of thyself to wash off sorrows and sufferings. What is the significance of this? We shall examine in what follows. Our modern world is full of legacies that were invented, begun and developed through the ages by adherents of the One Almighty. For instance, during the early decades of Islam, mosques acted as hubs for intellectual discourse. discourse. They were not only places of worship, but also housed uh, libraries that were open to the masses. And this was unusual at a time when libraries were usually just the reserve of the elite. In the year 859, the first degree-granting university was founded alongside a mosque in Fez, Morocco. And it's, it's still operating to the present day, almost 1,200 years later. It was a 10th century Muslim surgeon who invented many surgical tools which are still used in modern medicine. He also published a 1,500-page encyclopedia of surgery around the year 1000. And this was used in Europe as a medical reference for the following 500 years. In the field of mathematics, it was a 9th century Muslim mathematician who introduced a new unifying formula of algebra, which tied together Greek and Hindu systems. In the 11th century, it was a Muslim scientist who overturned ancient ideas of how our eyes work. The revolutionary engineering concept of the crank system was discovered by a Muslim engineer in the 12th century. The crank system converts rotary motion to linear motion, and this eventually led to the internal combustion engine and mechanised industry as we know it today. Coffee is a popular drink that can be found the world over, but it was first brewed as a drink in Yemen around the 9th century. And in its earliest days, moreover, coffee was used to help devotees stay up during late nights of prayer. It wasn't until the 16th century that coffee was consumed in Europe. So, when the facts of history show that religious world have been behind numerous and various significant material developments, naturally, one wonders, how is religious pursuit related to material advance? And this is worth closer examination to see if there is anything that can be learnt and applied in our own daily life for our own benefit. The five pillars of Islam represent the central practice for realising the One Almighty. And these are Kolima, Namaz, Roja, Hajj and Zakat. In English, these translate to vow, prayer, fasting, pilgrimage and alms. And in fact, these elements are common to many religious practices. And it so happens that Sri Sri Thakur commented on the reasons that underpin these practices. And his commentary is quite revealing. So he says that the significance of committing vows is that by making statements where we accept that which favours life and growth, we create the urge to discipline our lives accordingly with befitting thoughts and activity, ultimately making our lives purified. Through the recitement of prayer or words of praise, we bring to mind what is necessary for life. We do not pray, if we do not pray daily with love and devotion, 
then that which we should be doing, we may well forget and lose. Just consider, we are affected by the impulse from our environment. However, those very impulses, are, if they are themselves caused by passions in the environment, then they can cause our downfall. They can confuse us and take us away from the path of life and growth. In order to avoid that, we have to bind ourselves to a superior beloved with our utmost devotion. And through remembrance, we have to keep alive his wish and behave according to him. And prayer is the splendid vehicle for this. However, if our environment remains negative and it's always exerting a negative influence on us, then we are always in co conflict with it. Therefore, we need to proactively provide for those of our surroundings and improve them, for which charity and arms are integral. Now, for our own sustenance, in what we eat, there are nutritious elements that the body needs. But there are also toxic elements that unavoidably accumulate in the body. During the process of fasting, the body gets a chance to excrete these toxins. And the aim is to not only spend the day without eating, but also to remain engaged in higher thought, to be inspired by whatever is superior or propitious. And by this twin combination, a psychophysical effect is brought about and the body is physically purged of toxins. Mentally also, one accelerates the willpower for life and growth. So there are many facets that are not immediately obvious to the process of fasting. If we go on pilgrimage with attachment and regard, the stimulation of the superior beloved percolates us, and the urge for life and growth propels us towards the One Almighty. We become free from doubt regarding what is proper conduct and what is not. We adopt proper attitude, and that's reflected in our words and behaviour. And this itself is the divine, yet normal, touch. Therefore, upon our return from a holy place, we find that we are better equipped to overcome all the obstacles that we're presented with, having become more able to control circumstances and turn them in our favour. Hence, pilgrimage is so propitious if it is performed in the proper way. Now, considering the reasons that Sushi Thakur gave behind the common practices of vow, prayer, fasting, pilgrimage and alms, it becomes clear that they are not religious customs separate from daily life. Rather, each is the natural human method for the development of individual character in conjunction with a superior beloved. And as such, these are natural practices that can benefit all members of the human family, not just a particular sect. And the aim is to achieve ideal character. What also becomes apparent, taking a holistic view, is that the very religious endeavour for realising the One Almighty is intimately entwined to the pragmatic process of achieving ideal human daily life. And it is important to acknowledge also the fact that the practices comprising the five pillars of Islam, along with the other holy messages, were delivered through a medium that an ordinary human can relate to. That is, a messenger in human form. We believe in the One Almighty, and that he is omnipresent, and that he has always been present. But we have very little conception of his nature or identity, let alone understanding his wish and instruction in our lives. This is because, real though he may be, he is intangible to the common person. 
And it is only until the advent of his messenger in human form that the wish and instruction of the One Almighty is learnt and, moreover, that he can be humanly fathomed. Just as an example, consider the word kindness as an isolated concept without connection to a living, uh, living being. It doesn't of itself have any meaning because it is intangible. However, when it is conceived as a quality of behaviour of one living being towards another, then that concept can be easily grasped because it's now something tangible. So similarly, when the One Almighty is understood through the living being that he sends, then he becomes tangible. The kindness, love, devotion of his embodied representative are clearly felt through his ideal behaviour and ideal conduct, and this excites our physical being. Complexes are an integral part of our driving force of the human psyche, so part of ideal behaviour involves the regulation of our complexes. Thus, it is by the experience of human ideality by self-regulation that we can realise the One Almighty in a tangible way. Often, it is thought that the messenger of the One Almighty is but a gramophone commun communicating his word linguistically. However, Thakur said that messenger, no, message assimilated in character is the messenger of the message. So now we come to realise that the holy word of the Almighty breathes through the thoughts, words and deeds of the one he sends. It's not just a linguistic communication. It's being embodied and demonstrated by his messenger, bringing them to life and making them palpable for all who interact with him. He whom the Almighty sends is the superior beloved, who embodies what is humanly ideal. That is, he is the living ideal. And as such, these superior persons attract all individuals of humankind. They have something to offer to all individuals of humankind. They are sent for all individuals of humankind. When a university professor imparts knowledge of a subject to his students, there is no automatic guarantee that his students will understand everything with full clarity. Similarly, in the time of the past prophets, apostles and, and messengers, people listened to them, some tried to follow them, some became enlightened. But to the extent people cannot grasp or succeed in following the instruction of the living ideal, to that extent non-ideality remains, and the weight of deterioration persists. Moreover, the birth of new persons continue who may not experience the clear touch of the superior beloved. Therefore, many defects and misunderstandings can enter, which leads to misconduct. Furthermore, the world is itself always changing, presenting fresh challenges. The past century alone has been unpredictably revolutionary in the pace of change and our experience of life. And applying immemorial prescript to new circumstance presents difficulties. It was precisely with these difficulties that seekers came to Srishi Thakur, Anukul Chandra, for guidance on many points of confusion. During the course of discussion of one particular group of seekers, they queried the point that, according to what they had been taught, the time of the prophets had passed and will not return. And in an outburst of pain denial that beautifully bared Srishi Thakur's deep love and attachment for the Lord, and speaking with an urgency and emotional tremor, as if being torn from his own nearest and dearest one, which touched all those who were before him, Thakur said, The world remains, 
and it is still revolving. The negative forces of deterioration and death have not stopped spreading their influence on others. Yet one is to believe God himself has stopped. He is not sending the prophets anymore. So God no longer is going to represent the, the present the path of liberation by love to those fumbling in the darkness of ignorance. No longer going to enlighten their hearts by the light of love. Whatever duty God has towards humans, that has been completed. He will no longer heed the pain of humans. Is he no longer going to lend an ear in human form that is soaked in consciousness? Whatever is needed for the disillusioned and confused persons, is he not going to come and show them the truth? Has he completed and discharged his duty and gone? Sri Sri Thakur offered no proof by those words, but his words resonated loudly and eternally his love for the Lord and his love for life, which galvanised those who were present. Then, then, Sushi Thakur offered a prayer. Lord, I am your insignificant, unconscious child. I may not minutely abide by thy principle to reach thee, but for that matter, I will never, by any means, Turn away from thee. Hodrat, apostle, fulfiller of the past prophets, symbol of continuity, fulfiller the best, manifested inspiration of God. Please come, come again. Bless me so that becoming radiant by thy glow, becoming henceforth bowed with humility toward thee, with uncompromising success in every holy delivered word, May we prostrate and salute thee, the all-merciful, the creator. It was as if Tahur had joined the ranks of the seekers and led them in prayer. And they could see and feel that here was one who revered the heritage of their forefathers and could therefore lead them forward in harmonious continuity towards the Lord. Just consider, different universities around the world teach the same subject of medicine, for instance, but in different languages. Nonetheless, the body of knowledge imparted is the same and universal. Equally, in any one university, just in the way that students come and go from year to year, likewise over the years, university professors also change from time to time. But the essentials of the subjects taught remain the same. Different universities make different research efforts in the field of medicine. Based on current understanding, they will try to progress the subject field. One researcher at one university may make a profound discovery that causes a paradigm shift in the understanding of the subject. And that is understood to be a natural progression of the subject. That truth always existed. But time and circumstance came together for the discovery and utilisation at that point in time. And that is a gain for everyone. If we liken the world in which we play out our daily lives as a university amphitheatre, then the subject matter we are trying to master is our own character. Here too, a guide and instructor can make accessible the unknown if we lend them our attention. And what they impart is universal for all humankind. Here too, an expert may come along and examine the affairs of modern life and cause a paradigm shift in our understanding of suitable moral code and principle, as per the current circumstances that we face. Yet that is a natural progression from what preceded. And later messenger, uh, messengers never seek to disregard those that preceded. Rather, they came to deliver and further fulfil based on those who came before and what was said before. Therefore, in accepting the latest messenger of the One Almighty, 
one is not transferring to anything different, there is no division in the sincere effort for life and growth. When someone is enticed by the chance to feed the greed of complexes and passions and is snatched away from someone he was attached to and verbally accepts someone else lit deep, then, yes, then, difference is created and conversion occurs. In this scenario, attachment is torn. There's a betrayal of love out of selfish desire and unregulated passions. Those who convert in this way, their lives become scattered. Their life is full of imbalance and doubt as a consequence of the betrayal of love. As such, when these persons receive impulses from the environment, they cannot give it consideration or judgment. Therefore, they cannot control, balance nor resolve the situation. When they try to judge good or bad, they create confusion. So that at every step, of uh, it, their environment presents them an obstacle. Hence, their life is full of doubt and contradiction. However, if instead love is fulfilled, attachment is strengthened by adhering to a living ideal who embodies one's very object of love and attachment, then conversion does not occur. Rather, it is initiation. Then there is no discord. Rather, it is smooth continuity. When we surrender out of love, at his holy feet, then and there we become soaked with the elements of the living ideal. And from this, worship begins. We enjoy keeping his company. We enjoy doing that activity which makes him satisfied. We enjoy speaking about him. We feel like culturing in our life that which he likes. And all of this, that itself is the ceremony of vows. And whatsoever pertains to the living ideal, what he says, what he does, his preferences, his habits, everything, we naturally consider our holy message and guidance. We fulfil everyone and become more fulfilled ourselves. And in this process, we can enjoy the living ideal even more in return. We nurture everyone in the environment in life, fame and growth. Doubt, hindrance, animosity, agitation, these things cannot enter our lives in any manner. So such normal human urge towards the living ideal, which begets normal human practice for normal human elevation, that is the proper initiation. And this initiation is necessary, for we neglect the living ideal at our peril. We should remember that the messenger is sent by the One Almighty at our pain and cry, at our helplessness in not being able to manage the contemporary circumstances that we face. So if we reject the living ideal, then we also reject the ideal of human life that he embodies. The living ideal knows the art of living life normally without being servant to his own passions. He has attained this realization through his own activity and experience. By his demonstration, he is himself the comprehensible standard in whom we, can co we come to notice the full spectrum and extent of human possibilities. And it is that which illumines our own individual, hitherto unrecognised, shortfall. He becomes the yardstick against which we can understand ourselves and our own gaps and shortcomings. By the faculty dis to discern and the impetus to implement our discernments develops, all of this develops through attachment to the living ideal, hence the need for initiation. 
the extensive wisdom of the living ideal, which encompasses all the diverse potentialities of individual human life, coupled with his profound love for the manifestations of, of life, makes him someone who can fulfil each and every one according to their distinctiveness. And this quality of being all fulfilling makes him naturally the universal pivot and shelter of all diverse persons. Hence, initiation en masse unto a common living ideal provides the opportunity of unity and variety. Thus, we can breathe harmony and social integration into community and nation. Joy Guru. Bande Purushottama. আমি ধন্যবাদ জ্ঞাপন করছি সেই প্রসন্ন দেখে উনি উনার জীবনে শ্রী ঠাকুরকে নিয়ে চলুন থ্যাংক ইউ শ্রী প্রসন্ন রে উই উড প্রে ফর ইউ অ্যান্ড ইউর ফ্যামিলি ব্লিসফুল লাইফ অ্যাট দ্য হোলি ফিট অফ শ্রী শ্রী ঠাকুর জয় গুরু জয় গুরু শ্রী মনো মনোজ পাত্রা দা এসপিআর ইউএসএ जो गूगल में काम करते हैं उनका अनुभव और ठाकुर जी के जीवनी और पथ के बारे में इष्ट आलोचना करेंगे श्री मनोज पात्रा एस पी आर यू एस ए ही इज वर्किंग इन गूगल यू एस ए ही विल डू इष्ट आलोचना एंड ही विल थ्रो लाइट्स ऑन द लाइफ एंड आइडियोलॉजी ऑफ सी ठाकुर वंदे लोक तिलक सात्व वार्ता विभूषण अमर कृत्या प्रबुद्ध लोक जीवन प्रणय प्रमत्त जागदीपन वंदे जीवन जीवन सत्पुरुष आई ऑफर माई हार्टी प्रणाम एंड ओबिशंस एट द लोटस फीट ऑफ शिशि ठाकुर श्री श्री वर्मा श्री श्री बोलता एंड आचार्य देव श्री श्री दादा and other revered members of Thakur family. I also offer my loving pranam and joy guru to everyone who is watching the program today. A few days ago, uh, our dear Anand Sulevan Siddha, he reached out to me and, and asked me to record a few words that could be shared in this itself. So, <clears throat> I offer my hearty thanks to him, though I do not personally feel that I am qualified to give any message. I would like to share a few words from Sri Sri Thakur's ideology. As Sri Sri Thakur, in the Holy Satyanusaran, in the very first chapter, writes that first of all, we must, be, we must wage war on weakness. We must be bold and brave. And then we get the right entered the kingdom of heaven. Many times, Sri Sri Thakur and before him, every advent has spoken these words, that if you want to walk on the path of dharma, essentially follow the principles of being and becoming of life, or the principles that uphold and nurture existence, we have to be courageous. A weak person will not be able to either tread on the path or go very far on that path. We have to be brave. Now, brave in the sense, we have to have strength to be willing to overcome our complexes. The actual, the actual overcoming of the complexes will happen over time. But even to take the step that I want to understand my weaknesses, my complexes, I want to meaningfully adjust it following the commands of someone who I regard as my ideal. That needs strength. <clears throat> In the same Satyanu Saran, Sisi Thakur writes later that it is said fortune favors the brave. I mean, this is an age-old proverb. It's a fortune favors the brave. Those who are brave, they find 
more easily left than others. They feel life has been kind to them. The nature is acting very blissful to them. They keep getting these providential blessings and things just seem to move happy and lucky for them. The Thakur says that's right. Fortune favors the brave. And the signs of bravery he mentions are faith, reliance, and sacrifice. Now, let me try to explain in my own words these terms. The first term, faith. Let's take an example. Let's say we are traveling by a bus, and the bus happens to go through the winding roads of a hill to the hilltop. The bus is filled with passengers. Now, there are different kinds of passengers in the bus. Anybody can just imagine you, would have, you might have been in this situation. Some people enjoy that journey. Some people, the fear, they shudder in fear. Some even like vomit. They are not able to withstand the strain of that ride, that winding ride. But those who fear, they keep their eyes closed. They don't even have the strength to watch outside the window as they look at the steep, the, the steepness of the of the hill, or they look at the the valleys, the crevices. They just shudder. And the others who love the sight, they crane their neck out of the window and enjoy the beauty of the nature. As the bus climbs up, the things become smaller. So whether it is a bus journey, a short journey, or whether it is a plane journey, a journey by a cruise ship, or like by a helicopter, or even those roller coaster rides, some people just enjoy these short journeys. And some others, they fear at the mere mention of that uh, the moment they think, they just <laughs> they, they quiver in, in fear. Now, what's the difference? The difference is some people have a lot more faith <clears throat> on the pilot or on the driver or the entire machinery that is involved there. Now, <clears throat> those who do not fear, they enjoy the short journeys. And those who are afraid, they don't. If you ask them, so somehow we have reached the top. I just wish that I go down the hill also properly. <laughs> so for them, the journey is too risky. If they get on a roller coaster ride, as soon as the ride starts taking the steps, they just wish that the motor stops and this journey comes to an end. <laughs> the journey is not enjoyable to them. Now, our whole life is a long journey. Now, we really do not wish that the journey of life come to an abrupt halt or it ends too soon. We want to enjoy this journey. And in this long journey, we cannot ensure that it will always be a smooth ride. There will be bumps, there will be hiccups. It, the journey of life is more like a roller coaster ride. There are sometimes it climbs very high, slowly. Sometimes it seem, seem to go down very rapidly. Sometimes it takes loops and hoops and all that. <clears throat> now, those who are brave, they know life will throw multiple challenges at us. Life will make us go through these ups and downs, and they prepare themselves for that. Now, faith is the first attribute of being brave. Have faith on who? <clears throat> have faith on oneself. That is first. And have faith on an a strongly established center in life. If a person, a person who does not believe in himself will not be able to easily believe on another person. And to take the step of accepting a master in life, a teacher, a guide in life, and establish that guide as the ideal in one's life needs a lot of strength. Weak people cannot take initiation. It's strong people who can take initiation, who can accept a master. And then comes the second step of reliance. Now look at small kids and babies who are infants. If you fling them in air, most babies, they laugh. Ah. They know the father or the uncle who is playing with the kid, he throws him in the air and then the father will catch. 
Well, maybe the child has never fallen. Some children do show some innate fears and all that. But that the fear is so ingrained in their life that there is a psychological impression. And this is where scientists believe that children have these instincts right from their birth. And that they're like this question about how did this memory come to a child who has never ever experienced falling down? And why does he seek in fear? So, okay, so those small percentage of children apart, most children are able to enjoy because they rely on the person who is throwing them into the air. They know the person will catch, catch him as well. And so strong people are those who have faith and are able to rely on the master they have accepted. It is seen. Uh, there are people, well, this reliance definitely is of a higher level of reliance that Thakur has mentioned here. But even in our day-to-day -day life, uh, if, if you see, when we all work in the corporate world and all of us have worked under various managers, some managers work their work, do their work so efficiently, they are not insecure about their position. They find it easy to delegate the responsibility to the next rung of leadership below them. They are able to rely on their juniors to execute and give away work as delegation. And those who are insecure, they would not be able to delegate easily. Even if somebody else is given the task, they, they remain very fearful at heart, checking every now and then what happened, what happened, is it done, is it done, and they are not able to go in a composed manner. But those who rely, they delegate the work and they think about the next higher step that they can that they can do. And such people are able to execute much bigger projects, much more calmly with limited resources, without taking the tension and the strain of working on a single project and getting too bogged down into that. So faith and reliance, these two attributes are, are very close to each other. One has to be able to have faith on oneself and be able to repose the faith on a master. One has to be able to rely on oneself, one's peer group, and the ultimate reliance on the master's words and commands. If my master, if my guru has said something, then yes, it has to be done. If he has said that something will happen or something happens this way, yes, it happens that way. So this is to believe that and to be in that state needs a lot of courage. And then the third thing, sacrifice. Sacrifice is giving away something that others would normally hold on to. Think about anything that has to be given away. It needs a lot of courage to give up, to give up things. To give up one's weaknesses needs a lot of courage. If two people altercate with each other or have an argument, family members or friends or colleagues, uh, perhaps it dawns on both the parties who are altercating that uh, I was also at fault. Uh, the other person spoke, I also spoke. Maybe the other person started the argument, but I also used some harsh words. Now, both people may realize separately that they were also at fault. Now, who among them would be the first one to go and apologize? Think about it. Only the stronger one is capable of going and offer an apology or take the lead in offering an apology. So there's a small sacrifice involved there, sacrifice of one's ego to be able to do that. Similarly, one has to sacrifice various things. Uh, even on a physical plane, you see small children growing up and some children very easily share their toys, their belongings with their friends, and some others do not want to share. Now look at the attributes of both these children and see the ones who share easily are actually the more intrepid ones. They are the more brave ones. They are likely to take more risks and they are likely to succeed in their life much better. So this, this has to be habituated. It has to be inculcated in one's habit that we want to become brave, we want to become strong. Thereby, we have we grow a tendency to do better and better and be on this path of virtue and good in our lives. Slowly and steadily, we take the steps. So 
this whether it is faith reliance sacrifice the signs of bravery this means underlying person is becoming courageous being more and more courageous the courage uh, as the sign of strength is also visible in the natural world even in many animal forms many many animal life forms you see how do penguins teach their children to take a dive into the ocean so that they can catch their fish and survive the baby penguins are very afraid of venturing into the ocean they live on ice slabs yes well i'm speaking about the penguins in the south pole let's say but they walk on those ice base but they don't want to take a leap so the parents lead them to the edge of that edge of that block uh, make the generate a curiosity to see down as if something very fascinating is there below that and they go and kick the baby penguin into the water <laughs> and when the baby penguin fall into the water there is other parent is perhaps already down there to uh, to give an assistance if needed they they, they they flip their flippers and they start swimming that is how they learn whether it is mountain goats who push their babies or kids below the cliff so that they learn how to do whether it is eaglets or owlets the way they learn how to fly with the help of their parents they are all pushed away from the nest uh, so that they the the flap their wings and, and learn to fly even in the animal world they teach their youngsters to take this courageous step to be able to learn the essential skill for their survival it's a bit unfortunate that many human beings because of their strong attachment and a sort of greed that their kid remain continuously safe do not push their kid onto the right path where uh, they can inherently become more courageous but those who understand they do some many parents you know have started becoming over protective about their children over possessive about their children and unfortunately this this attribute of being over protective actually hampers the right growth of the children this is a realization that many many parents don't get but those who are brave they know the steps to take to make their own children brave and courageous so that they can relish the life enjoy the life to the fullest now this courage uh, courage again comes in various forms but on a particular basis of whether the courage is positive or negative whether it leads us to the positive or to the negative it can be classified as belonging to two categories we call it as asat virodhi parakram or asat nirodhi parakram which is like whether it is a evil um, combative courage or evil confronting courage and the other one is evil resisting courage so in the former type uh, a person looks at evil is not happy with it which is unjust has to do something to be strong but the approach is very confrontational and as a result the person is not able to dissuade others from giving up the path of evil and is not able to address much on the contrary one is likely to grow enmity with others thereby decreasing one's influence with time and in the second approach it is because the intention is to to discard the evil it is not the person against who the dislike is growing it's against those actions or maybe those thoughts the behavior those conduct that lead to incorrect actions the strong feeling is against those thoughts and those conduct and the intention therefore is to get that out without disliking hate is a very strong term i use it very very rarely so without disliking the person is to dislike those thoughts and actions and only focus on that so that is the evil resisting courage everyone should try to inculcate in one's own habit this courage which is evil resisting courage i'll give a small example as to from this is the babadas uh, life uh, an experience that he himself shared in a karma seminar several years ago 
So Pujine Bawaida was about 10, 11 years old. He used to play football those days. And after playing with the football or cricket after his evening game, he would go to a very senior uh, Karmi, a resident worker in the ashram, who had the privilege of witnessing Sri Sri Thakur from very close quarters. He was a part of the team that migrated from Pavna to Devghar uh, with Thakur way before 19, in the year 1946. And he lived several decades after that with Sri Sri Thakur. So being a very aged Karmi and having so much of rich experience with him, he was also an eloquent speaker. <coughs> he would narrate those stories of Sisi Thakur and others would listen to him. Uh, obviously, Pujine Babaida was also very interested in listening to uh, stories about Sisi Thakur from him. So he would go and listen uh, to stories from this gentleman. So one day, as Pujine Babaida <coughs> went to the room, stood at the door, he saw something that he did not find as appropriate. So <clears throat> he left immediately and the following day he went again, similar situation. The person is seated on his bedstead. Many other visitors of, to the ashram, they are seated on the floor below and listening to him with abject attention. So within a Baba Ida said, uh, like, I want to have a private talk with you. He would address him as grandpa, who was that old. So on listening that, those visitors, they stepped out of the room. Um, and then he said, I see that you <clears throat> you speak very well, I like that. But I have to tell that you keep you are keeping your feet on this box. And this box contains books of Sisi Thakur. Those books have Sisi Thakur's photograph. And you are resting your feet on the box. I don't think it is appropriate. But that gentleman, he immediately realized his mistake. He apologized and said, what to do? Uh, so, uh, like my legs hurt when they, when they dangle in air. If I don't rest them somewhere, they really ache a lot. And so I rest them on that box. So, <clears throat> and then Pujana Bhavada said, I realized that. And so I have brought this wooden stool for you, which you can use as a footrest. So, Pujana Bhavada, <clears throat> even at a young age of 11, had this maturity that if he admonished him or chastised him in front of others, <clears throat> point out his mistake and say, you are a senior person, but you are doing this, it won't have done any good to anyone. On the contrary, people who were listening to him might have lost their respect towards this gentleman by some notches. And in that proportion, they might have lost respect to the words he was speaking about, the otherwise beautiful and living words of Sisi Thakur. It wouldn't have done good to anyone. On the contrary, he knew the cause of the problem. He addressed the problem. And the following day, in a very humble manner, he made the person realize his mistake and gave a solution to address his issues as well. See, this is the kind of courage that we need. A, so many times we feel, oh, that other person is too senior to me. He's more powerful to me. He's in a higher position to me. So what right do I have to make him understand his mistake? Or if he's that senior, whatever he's doing uh, would definitely be correct. Perhaps I don't have the right understanding. So no, we have to have a clear sense of judgment. And when things are not as per the line of what our master or Thakurji has told, then it is incorrect. But because it is incorrect, always blatant, blatantly telling it out, telling it out publicly or in a manner that is hurtful to others, people are not going to accept. On the contrary, many may reject Thakur's words, which is not in, not in our interest. So the right way is to grow, harbor this habit of real courage, the evil resisting courage in us. And that is why Thakur said, resist evil with a skilled hand. The message in the messages. Then he also said, resist evil, but create not enmity. Message volume 5 is a message from that. So, see, C.C. Thakur has always asked us to be strong, to be bold, be brave, and thus equip ourselves with inner strength to be able to follow the path of Dharma. 
Sri Sri Thakur, uh, Sri Thakur one, it is taken from the holy book Anushruti. Says, I'll tell the uh, the Bengali one and then the English one. Says, Ishta Nishar Vibhor Tane, Swastya Vidhi Palvire, Bhalo Kichu Ele Mone Takshuni Tai Karvi. Poristitir Bacha Vadai, Jatno Nye Sarbo Khan, Ishta Pane Uchetie, Dharvi Tule Tadir. Ishta Vriti Jogar Kore Nitya Karis Nivedan. Shakti Pavi Mukta Havi Devon Karmaya. So he says, with an unrepelling pull towards the ideal, follow the principles of health. If anything propitious comes to mind, translate that into action immediately. Remain ever vigilant and conscious about the growth of the environment and hold their minds aloft in the higher tiers of the ideal. Make arrangements for Ishtavriti and offer the same on a daily basis. Then, if you do all this, that's Thakur's assurance, you will gain strength <coughs> and liberate yourself. And this is the path of Dharma. So, <coughs> we all have accepted Sisi Thakur. It is my earnest urge to everyone who has accepted Sisi Thakur to follow him as ardently and sincerely as possible. And for those who haven't, it's an invitation to them to come talk to many Guru Bhais, to many people who have who have understood Sisi Thakur that he came and try to understand his basic ideology. And if you feel it's fulfilling to life, then why not accept the prophet of the age as the master of our life? So I wish and pray for everybody's health, good health at Lotus Foot of Sisi Thakur. Sarve Bhavanta Sukhinha, Sarve Santu Miramaya, Sarve Bhadrani Pashyanta, Mahakashti Takra Bhaga Bhavet Bandi Purushota. Jai Guru. Dhanyavad, Manujda, Ham Aapka and Aapke Parivar Ki Mangal Kamna Thakur Ji Ke Sri Charno Me Karte Hai. Thank you, Shri Manaj Patra, for your beautiful istalachana and speeches. We are really inspired. Jai Guru. Jai Guru. Amadir Arab Africa Satsang Utsavir Sartakota Punya Tirtha Devgar Dham Thikki Am Amadir Pujniya Acharyadev Shishri Dadar Ashirvade Pujniya Binkida Amadir Uchave Aloshna Korche Evam Acharyadev Shishri Dadar Ganer Modame Uni Amadir Ke Jibuner Pote Cholar Nirdesh Korche Ye Nirdesh Palune Amra Mangoler Adikari Hovo Jukpurshotam Shishri Thakur Anuko Chandre Aksho Tetis Tamo Shubajon Momotso Shobar Oklante Porishome Guru Vahira Evam Guru Bohenara Kub Shundur Kore E Onushtan K Shafulla Koreshin Evam Vibina Jagateke UK USA Ghana Kuwait Oman Tanzania Bangladesh or India Apnar Dur Durantu Teke Uchave Jukto Hoechen Evam Jara E. Onustane, Bhajan, Kirtan, Alushna Korechen, Apna Ke Shubaike, Arab Africa Satsang Pokoteke, Shubar Shurwangin Shishi Thakur Churne, Mangal Pratana Kori. Shubai Bhalutako, Shushthako, Ishtamuki, Hoi Cholun, Param Onande, Thakun, Jaiguru. One day Purshottam. Bande Purushotam, Bande Purushotam, Bande Purushotam, Bande Purushotam, Bande Purushotam, Param Premaji 
बढ़ेगा ये तू भी जाने तोड़ के बंधन सारे गुरु गुरु की थाम 